we go to them for the comments. So let me begin with Andy Hoffman, the Holson Professor of Sustainable Enterprise Roth School of Business at the University of Michigan. And we want your take on this. Help us frame, Andy, what this discussion should focus on and how realistic we need to be. Please go ahead. Well, in the, in the spirit of uh, Zoom calls and COVID globally, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. <laughs> um, I've been asked to kick this off, so uh, I'm going to play a bit of the role of the provocateur. Um, begin with a, 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 an, an assertion, and that is that capitalism, uh, the system that raises the standard of living of millions of people all over the world over the past century is now in crisis. Uh, this is an assessment not just from critics outside the market, from many within the market. Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel laureate in economics, says that capitalism needs to be saved from itself. Or Paul Pullman, the former CEO of Unilever, says that capitalism is, quote unquote, a damaged ideology that needs to be reinvented for the 21st century. Uh, when I look at the, the, the critics, the critiques of capitalism, I see them falling on primarily two areas. One its inability or its failure to address problems in the natural environment, AKA climate change, and its inability to address issues in the social environment, AKA income inequality. And both of those issues threaten our societies globally, nationally, locally, and something needs to be done. To my mind, COVID has exposed those problems to a greater degree. It's, it's irritated them and made them vividly clear that we've got some serious problems and I would add, they're problems caused by the market. In fair criticism, the market caused these problems, but I think it's important to recognize the market has to solve them. And the market is the most powerful orienting institution on earth, business is the most powerful entity within it. If business doesn't solve these problems, they will not be solved. And so that brings the problem to the door of business schools. Um, my feeling is that business schools need to adapt and recognize what role they've played to, tr to train the leaders that have guided the market to causing these problems and shift in a way to train a new set of leaders to deal with the markets of tomorrow. Um, the challenges of capitalism require systems change. The challenges for business school also require systems change. And that's what I think we're here to talk about. And uh, I will turn it back to you, Pamela, to help us uh, tease these questions out. Unmute myself there. Thanks, Andy, very much. I think uh, you've set it up well. This is the ultimate teachable moment where we have to figure out uh, what the the next steps are. And I think you've uh, you've started out with a pretty provocative comment. See whether uh, others agree on that. I want to go to uh, Vanita Datla. She's the vice chairperson and managing director of Alico. Uh, a pioneer in analytic instruments industry with expertise in innovating to connect science with the lab. And that's always a concept that we're trying to deal with. Does the, does the real world um, actually come into play when we're teaching uh, business schools and leaders of tomorrow? Those connections are very important. Benita, your, your comments, please. Thank you, Pamela, and uh, thank you, Sudhir, for inviting me for this uh, panel discussion on a very relevant topic today. Yes, as Andy has mentioned, today, whatever was taught fundamentally and conceptually, whether we are in a position to apply that to real life situations, and that is what is necessary, especially for leaders of uh, corporates, leaders of institutions to understand how to survive in, uh, in a VUCA world. In fact, um, I've spent about 27 years in corporate life. And uh, today, I'm very proud to say that I have joined the Indian School of Business, of which the Dean is also here on this panel, uh, Rajendra Srivastava for an executive doctoral program, because I realize that applied research is one thing that is necessary even for leaders in the corporate space. And uh, the, the ongoing research that happens, and especially in the areas that one would like to focus, delve deeper and understand critical issues that could actually shape your own organization that can shape your employees. And one can become a role model in understanding that lifelong learning is a must. Most of you must be aware that India recently came out with a, 
a much more improved national education policy in which it does focus upon lifelong learning, not only for the academicians, but also for professionals. So this is one area that is close to my heart. And since I've joined the doctoral program, I've become a role model within my own company. And I've got my top leadership actually join executive uh, programs uh, at senior level and graduate level to equip themselves, to transform themselves into becoming the, that sort of a leader that will be able to deal with uh, the uncertainties that we will be facing in the future. So I'll stop there, Pamela, and okay, I will hand thanks. it over. That's great. Thanks, Vanita. Uh, some really, of course, important ideas there that this is uh, going to be a lifelong exercise. We go next to uh, Sweden, to Per Kramer, Dean for the School of Business, Economics and Law at the University of Gothenburg, uh, to take a look at how it's seen from there, um, the kinds of networks that we need to see these changes realized. Per, go ahead. You'll have to unmute yourself. Thank you there very much. There we go. And Thanks. Certainly a challenge to express a view on the effects of the pandemic in two minutes. This is an <laughs> issue which I could speak a couple of hours for. First of all, I would like just to set down that I perceive the pandemic very much to be a catalyst for the furthering transformative trends that were already underway and also making in sufficiencies in society, very clear, like the challenge of climate change, uh, like the weakness of multilateral regulatory structures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What I would like to focus on here, very briefly, that is that this catalyst in the format of the pandemic has led to a rapid introduction of new applications of digital technologies and artificial intelligence, speeding up at Transform, transformative structural changes that were already underway. Formats of organizations, business models that we have been taken for given are rapidly becoming redundant. They have to be adapt, have to adapt or die and be substituted with others, new ones. Principles for allocation of responsibility in society have to be reformulated. This is an absolute necessity in order to handle AI-assisted decision-making and machine learning. And we see also increasing demands for negotiating social contracts. The professional roles that we are educating for are changing at an increasingly rapid speed. And moreover, what we can see also that uh, new applications of AI and DT have effects for the exercise of democracy and also contributes to the, the demarcation line between statement of facts and statement of opinions are becoming increasingly blurred. So uh, quite this topic, isn't it? Uh, my point is here that the academy of course, including business schools, has a responsibility both to respond to the new demands for knowledge and competence, but also to keep clear this demarcation line between opinions and statements of facts. Otherwise, we can't discuss anything worthwhile. And in order to do that, we have to have finely tuned antennas to identify, the, identify these shifting demands for knowledge and competence. This is something that we at my school are doing in very close collaboration, both with corporate and public actors around us. It underlines the importance of multidisciplinarity in research and education, a close relationship between research and education. And perhaps most of all, I think that it highlights the necessity to include ethical perspectives in business education. We educate young people for taking up professional roles where they have power. 
And we have to teach them that with power follows responsibility, not only for their own well-being, but also for the organizations they are active within and for society at large. And this is probably the most important contribution business schools could do today in order to face tomorrow's challenges. It's a really a very good point. And I'm telling you the, the debate between opinion and statement of fact or, or facts is rampant inside the media business in which I spent many years as well. And I think it, it has, uh, in, it's infiltrated in an awful lot of different areas. All right, let's now go to South Africa. Merrick Abel, founder and CEO of Prime Serve Group Limited, a successful business that focuses on providing um, human capital management services, I guess, to find a broad category to major companies. So Merrick, go ahead with your opening comments. Good morning, Pamela, and thank you. Thank you. And thank you again, Sadir, for inviting me to join this round table. Just to put in context, South Africa is currently in our 204th day of our state of disaster, probably the world's longest continuous lockdown, even though we're at level one, we are still under a, a formal lockdown here in South Africa. So I focus on a, a real life business uh, issue that, that is uh, specific to South Africa more so than anywhere else. And I'd like to highlight a, uh, a single change that, that's affected as a result of the, the pandemic. And, and, but, but to do so, I need to contextualize the South African environment first in relation to first world countries. And so if you look at Canada, the UK, and to bring it home to BC specifically, uh, they're all experiencing unemployment rates of between 5 and 8%. And even in June this year, they experienced in BC an, un an unemployment rate of 13%. And this rate was the worst since the, the Great Depression. And so if you, you look at South Africa, it's noteworthy to note that in South Africa, we have a baseline unemployment rate of around 35% as was reported today, and that the unemployment rate of the youth in South Africa, that is the, the age group 15 to 24, is currently in the high 50 percentile level. So if you look at that, this is absolutely catastrophic in anyone's language and, and contextualizes how different our continent is and our country is from first world countries in dealing with the, not only the impacts of the pandemic, but also the socioeconomic issues that face our country. So on the ground and as part of our response to the pandemic, uh, since the lockdown was introduced in March, we tried to look at playing a role in addressing what we considered were the socioeconomic crises that the country was facing. And, and Prime Server and, and our corporation is a fairly large employer. And so we took the view that we needed to act very urgently to save jobs as an overriding imperative to everything that we did. And so we implemented a simple and immediate change across our organization. We, 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 we sat down with our management and staff and we, we implemented a, a group-wide management and executive, executive remuneration um, readjustment across every job category to the extent that we didn't do this just for a month or two. We adjusted the entire remuneration policy of the group and brought costs down from every remuneration level for a year to 18 months into the future. And we did this in order to fund and secure vulnerable jobs, because that's the greatest issue that we face in our country. And as part of this job saving program, we partnered with our major corporate clients, mostly multinationals, who were considering and were dealing with enormous uh, levels of retrenchments that they were about to embark on. And we agreed to, to manage their, employ their, their retrenchment programs in a way where their staff, who are actually our staff, would remain fully employed, despite the fact that their business was unable to operate for three to six months. Now, this particular change flies directly in the face of that often commonly held view that organizations, and particularly those listed publicly, need to maximize short-term returns above all else. And, and I think, you know, from a business perspective, that's quite a difficult decision to make. So we took a view that responsible leadership now outweighs short-termism. And, and so we took a little bit of shareholder uh, pressure, but we, we stuck to that particular point of view. And in reporting, we made a decision that we would impact the lives of those that, that we employ and that we affect, roughly 60,000 people on a daily basis. 
and, and, and did so in order to ensure that we did what we could do to stop them slipping back into poverty. I think that brings to the fore a particular issue that we face in South Africa and maybe first world countries don't necessarily face at the same level. Very, very interesting perspective, and I hope we will, and we will have time to get into that. So, Merrick, thank you very much for that. All right, moving on now uh, to uh, Peru, to Percy Makina, uh, the Director General of the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru, uh, focuses on his education and teaching strategic business administration, and has uh, studied, of course, uh, across the world, including in the U.S. So, a perspective... Um, from you, Percy, we would appreciate that. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Trying to answer the, the questions and trying to contribute to the, to the debate. Uh, I should try to say some basically ideas in order to make a framework for what we are dealing with. Uh, as we may know, we are in a new kind of environment where it's characterized by vol volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. But I should add an additional fact, what I should call passional confrontation. And it has been possible through the new technologies, to the development of the media. And we have, as, a, as an example, recently knew it in the elections of the United States, where the media, the, the, the social media, the people are not rational as the economy says. They are making flourishing order passions and to express. So that's another characteristic that we have to deal with in this new environment. Okay, what can we do? We should uh, learn for the strategic management approach. And for us, and trying to answer that, we have to find ways to try to integrate, to try to solve and work in this uh, new environment. For me, there are two parallels paths that we have to follow. The first one is that we have to continuously manage the present. We cannot forget the present because, as you mentioned, if we don't manage it, we should not have future. But in the very same moment, we have to invent the future where we want to compete. And we have to be aware that this path, manage the present, compete today, and invent the future and compete for tomorrow, have different processes, different paradoxes model, and we have to deal with it. Probable in the present, we have to follow a linear continuous improvement process. But constructing the future, we need an exponential model, strategic, and organization process. The problem is how can we do it simultaneously? Because we don't have time. The competition is not going to wait for us. The problems is not going to wait for us. The passional confrontation is not going to wait for us. So what have we learned as a business school to try to deal with this process? Uh, as me, as all of all the deans of the business school have to deal with the COVID and immediately all our models have to be closed. We have to reinvent something to continue giving the service. Okay, we have learned, uh, we have dealt in a very good way, but the key success factors were we we discover very rapidly that we need a culture of trust as the key of collaboration. When we need uh, rapid answers, we cannot follow the traditional rules. Uh, the Dean should not have the answer for everything. So we have to start trusting more in all our collaborators because there are a lot of things to be developed and to be solved. So the first key to the factor of culture of trust. The second one, importantly, agility as a, as a methodology for the strategy and for implementation. And obviously here comes all the methodologies that we know that they are in the market, as Scrum, design thinking, and so on. We have to be as fast as we can. And another important 
factor in the back office of the business schools and for companies. People need transcendent leadership. I mean, they need to feel humans. They need to feel that they are hosted, that they are be helped in this remote work. Those are the four key success factors that have worked for us to deal with the present. And in terms of developing the future, uh, we have decided to change totally the model in the that we are going to use to deliver our classes in the future. We are, and in this case, we are constructing our future. We are not responding to the COVID. <laughs> right now, responding to the COVID, we are delivering 100% all of our programs in a virtual learning uh, traditional model. But after COVID, we have decided that we are not going to return to the past. In the future, all or, of our classes should be developed under what we call hybrid flex model. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. That the uh, students who are at home or are at the campus should learn together through virtual basis. The ones who prefer to go to the campus, go to the campus. The ones who wants to remain at home, they can do it. We okay. value those alternative alternatives. And that, we that's... are changing the virtual learning from synchronous model to a synchronous model. That's more or less the way that we are trying to, yeah. to show how can we talk. That's a very interesting um, idea and approach. And I think everybody's probably struggling with that, which is what do you do after? You have to just cope in the moment now, but we need a new a set of structures going forward. So thank you, Percy, very much. And we'll come back to that. Uh, it's one of the issues that I think is, is really important about how we learn and how we teach going forward. I want to move now back to Canada to Wendy Hansen. She is president and CEO of the Sioux Area Hospital, uh, providing health services to a, a broad geographic space, northern Ontario, very huge uh, swath of land. And her career is both public and private sectors, but looking at the health sector, patient safety, system transformation, all of these things are key, Wendy, as we all uh, look at, uh, at, at our various worlds in the uh, middle of the pandemic and the health sector has been the subject of a lot of focus. So please go ahead with your thoughts. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, Senator Wallen's opening comments certainly captured our reality in healthcare. We are living the reality of real retooling, regrouping, and refocusing. And of course, being at the front face of care delivery, we're not only trying to prepare and adapt, but we have to concurrently um, uh, be able to provide safe and uh, uh, real-time care. So those uh, interdependencies and gaps, certainly in the Canadian system, have had a big light shone on uh, where those opportunities are and where we can do so much better. Um, in Sadir's query, he indicated, however, identify one change uh, that we're making that would continue to advance uh, within my healthcare organization and the health system. And if I had to select one, I, I would say it is in the space of digital health. And in Canada, we are a public healthcare system, and I think my comments will be fairly congruent with pairs in that, you know, we've been, we were making these changes and adapting in the space of digital health, but COVID-19 has certainly accelerated uh, the adoption of digital health technologies within the industry in, in the Canadian context in, in any event. So by way of example, pre-COVID, we were only uh, providing 4% of our primary care visits virtually. At this point in time, uh, this, uh, since the start of the pandemic, that number is now 60%. Um, so digital health, uh, certainly enabled by health analytics, have truly been game changers uh, to our industry and are accelerating the transformation of healthcare um, in this country. And the impacts we're seeing are both at the direct patient care level, but as well as helping us manage healthcare system performance at the broader systems level. And so we're leveraging this period of disruption due to the pandemic to accelerate and change and embed innovations. Uh, and by way of example, predictive analytics, which allow us to improve efficiencies in our day-to-day -day operations and thus favorably impact um, our resource utilization. And we're also using digital, or starting to move on more proactively on digital platforms that enable us to enhance uh, communications between patient providers. So virtual care consults being one, but uh, it, it gets so much broader and beginning to empower patients by building their own personalized care plans um, 
using digital technologies. And if we take that really broadly out um, concurrently at a broad systems level, um, and again, accelerated through research and some of our large academic research institutions, uh, we have, of course, the ability to analyze data now at scale and leveraging artificial intelligence and precision health are certainly increasing our ability to um, be more accurate in our disease detection and, of course, build unique and targeted personalized uh, treatment plans. So the effect of COVID, you know, certainly has created a further urgency for all industries. Um, and I would say in healthcare, digital health adoption has been accelerated by necessity due to COVID. And it's certainly a, a momentum that we want to maintain as we emerge from the pandemic. So, uh, you know, all of these uh, approaches will help us provide more value to patients and optimize the health system to ensure it is going to be sustainable. And, and yeah. as I know, we're all facing a certain a certain crisis uh, from a financial perspective. So, and, and be attentive as well in the business school context of how we're preparing our healthcare leaders to deal with this type of complexity going forward. So thank you. No, you really are the one dealing with this in real time. There's no question about that. So thank you for that insight and that perspective. And we'll be back to that question as well. We uh, go next to uh, Nico Nicola Klein, Dean of Executive Education at Rotterdam School of Management at Erasmus University. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, and her business, of course, as with all deans and professors in this situation, is reinventing education in the middle of all this, even for executive MBAs and for the people that are coming back for that lifelong learning. So, Nicola, uh, go ahead with your comments. Thank you, Pamela. I, I loved Sudhir's comments about lands on which we live and work because I stepped away from my very beloved South Africa in May, I've just returned there for a month. So it's been fascinating living across two different countries, um, it being exposed to two very different university systems during this very fractious time. Um, I have no doubt that in, in both countries, I think it's felt more, um, more severely in South Africa, but I, I loved Wendy's comment about how are we retooling, regrouping and refocusing. Um, I think that's what we're going through as a world, and whether that's in medical care or whether that's in business schools or economies or geopolitics, this is what's happening right now. But I have to disagree with Andy when he speaks that business needs to solve this and business schools need to solve this because I don't think business can solve it on their own. I think what COVID has made us realize is our very fragile codependencies and the extent to which we actually have to work together. And so specifically, I think for business schools, um, I love what Per said, um, this question about um, rethinking what we do, looking multidisciplinarily, um, thinking about ethics. I think at the core of this, the problems that business schools have tried to solve for have fundamentally shifted. And so where we might have bred uh, generations of technocrats able to spew out large financial models in the 1970s and 80s, perhaps we're returning to our managerial roots on the question of the profession of management, and that's not just in business, but that's more broadly. So the problems we need to solve for are changing. I think the question of who we're working with and how we are working with them is also fundamentally shifting. So I come from a world in which professors profess they are meant to have the answers and occasionally they, um, uh, they acknowledge their frailties when they try and pose research questions. But actually, um, I think we have to fundamentally change this and start saying we don't have the answers. What we have are remarkable convening spaces to bring together multiple stakeholders to try and solve these problems. And so I don't think we've spent enough time listening to youth. I don't think we've spent enough time always engaging with business. It's been fascinating at Rotterdam seeing a shift beyond research to speak about impact and engagement with local business, because also as business schools, we've suddenly realized that we are geographically bounded. If you're Harvard Business School, you are still subject to the governor of Massachusetts. If you're based in South Africa, you're in a lockdown. If you're in the Netherlands, well, people don't seem to wear too many masks here, but um, you know, you social distance. So your, your, what you do depends on your context. I think business schools also have to be very careful that they don't become hypocritical and that they're practicing what they're preaching. So the question of who has voice, who has access to our schools, who is able to learn from us um, is something that um, is, is all dear to our hearts and plays out in different ways. Different countries have different problems to solve in this regard, but we can't be hypocritical. And I think then the question, of course, is with these three questions, what problems are we solving for? Who are we working with? And how are we practicing what we preach? 
this question of technology and what role it can play in accelerating change is something that we can't ignore, no matter where we are. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola. That's terrific. All right. We move uh, back to the United States, to Arlington, Virginia. Maury Piperl, the Dean of George Mason University School of Business, and his thoughts on um, change and talent and leadership, and particularly when we're talking about that uh, interdependency that we have and, and working in markets, meeting demands uh, of markets across borders. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. And, and welcome to Washington, as it were. Listen, I, I've spent 30 years uh, of my career in Europe. I, and when we talk about markets, and I, I did, I'd like to pick up on what Nicholas said about what Andy said, you know, markets need to be engaged to fix things. I think he said markets, not businesses. And so there are things that you have to include around the edges. Regulation is the main one. But, you know, who are the stakeholders in, in a market? My, uh, my former classmate, Rebecca Henderson at Harvard Business School is in the middle of this conversation now as they try to figure out where they're going. And her book this year on reimagining capitalism in a world on fire touches on a number of things we've been uh, getting at. What it says, I think, for those of us in education and in the talent pipeline, if you will, is how do we develop people, business leaders, et cetera, who will be able to help craft you know, and collaborate to, to grow these uh, correctly regulated markets. Correctly is a, quite a difficult uh, thing to achieve. A lot of it, I think, has to do with developing uh, global citizens. Well, citizens first and then global citizens, uh, essential, as part of what we do in education. It should be fundamental to what a business school does. It certainly is in our school and has been already for a number of years. It also comes back to something uh, that uh, Vanita said about um, lifelong learning or what I like to think of as learning to learn. So there's a discipline that you can also help uh, uh, develop in people, which is about learning to learn. And that applies in the citizenship side, in the education side, and definitely in the work side, because the workplace continues to change. Uh, for us in the delivery end, uh, clearly the, the technology side and the needs of the pandemic have meant that the multimodal or hybrid, as we've been discussing, approaches just become normal. It's just the way you do things. And for many businesses, it's already been, particularly global businesses, it's been normal for 20 years. So why can't business schools uh, get there as well? And we have worked hard to do that. And then the, the last piece of it, I think, um, that increases this idea of trust, the culture of trust that Percy was talking about that I think is essential, is to, is to put front and center these, um, these needs, the critical short-term needs of your stakeholders that help you allow the, the long-term view to, to come in. For us, it's pretty simple stuff. We have students who are experiencing hardship. Do we figure out how to help them? We have put together a student emergency fund that made a big difference. Staff, we give a few days off because we know they need them because they're coping with so much. And the whole side of communication and building this culture to help us toward the future is a tough thing in COVID. Uh, one thing I've done is I've just been writing a, a note to our school every single day since the crisis began, just to help to tie people together. I think that's really, really important. And I will leave it there for now. Thank you very much, Maury. I appreciate that. Very, uh, very sharp, very focused. So let's now go to, uh, uh, well, back to Canada, to uh, Christian Kittleson, a partner at Deloitte in the financial advisory practice and leads the mergers and acquisitions practice for British Columbia on enterprise profitability, due diligence, and post-merger integration. So those are some issues that a lot of um, uh, businesses will be dealing with. I, I, we should also note that these alumni of Gustafson School, uh, Gustafson School of Business are hosts for all of this. So Christian, go ahead with your comments. Well, thank you very much, Senator, and uh, very much appreciate everybody's time today. And I'm just mm -hmm. a little bit north of Sidir, and I'd also like <laughs> to say that I'm on the uh, unceded territory of the Cowichan people uh, on Vancouver Island. So pleased to be here today. And yes, um, leading mergers and acquisitions and, and looking at enterprise profitability when I was thinking about this question and, and how to respond I think probably most people would think I'd start talking about e-commerce platforms and how uh, we need to expand into the virtual market and those types of things. It may surprise you for, for, from my perspective that I'd, what I'd like to talk about and, and what I see as an impact is mental health. And I think uh, a lot of you are, are speaking to it um, through your comments already. Maury, I think you were just uh, talking about it with, with your students, with your staff. 
Um, those of you who would be familiar with a, a firm like Deloitte understands that we uh, have a tremendous requirement for, for young and intelligent uh, people to come on board and, and help to work with us. Um, those fundamentals and those paradigms have been changing rapidly uh, over time. Those young people are very interested in the, solving the big problem. So we've seen significant issues with political unrest. We've seen it with racial unrest. And now mm -hmm. to push us over the edge, we've seen it with, with health unrest and pandemics. And the impacts uh, are, are profound in terms of the mental health that I think people are experiencing. And some people solve it by growing a terrible looking pandemic beard. Um, others may uh, look at it and, and need uh, incredible help in a different way. And our business um, is, is now all done virtually. Um, and when you think about what I was trained to do when I went to the wonderful school of uh, Gustafson, um, we, we were taught collaboration. We were taught about uh, multi-stakeholder relations and concepts of developing a collaborative path forward. Um, that's a fundamental uh, paradigm of my business today. And it's changed. It's significantly changed. My, particularly for my young staff, they've been living in 500 square foot apartments uh, for the last seven or eight months. Right. Um, that's having a tremendous impact on people. And I think that from a school perspective, what does that mean from a management education? It means that students are going to have to be taught not only how to adapt to this new world, which, quite frankly, I don't see changing anytime soon and, and may continue to, to change, but also what about the managers? Because uh, we're all used to seeing these people every day and having comments and having coffees and, and being able to connect with people through a personal relationship. That's all changed. It's all virtual now. And the impact of that is going to be significant. And I think that we're all going to have to think long and hard about how to uh, react to that. Thank you very much for really uh, highlighting that, because I do think it underlies everybody's comments that we've heard today that the mental health component of this cannot be underestimated in any way. And we do have to build that into our management structures and our learning in, into our education. People are going to be coping with this uh, for a long time. And some of those students are in far less than 500 square feet too. So thanks, uh, Christian, very much. Okay, we go now to, um, uh, to the Indian School of Business, Rajendra uh, Srivastava, uh, the Dean and Novartis Professor of Marketing Strategy and Innovation at the Indian School of Business. Mm -hmm. Hyderabad and Mohali both. He wants to make sure that we mention both or otherwise he gets into trouble. Uh, and also was uh, a dean at, uh, at Austin and Emory University. So uh, Raj, why don't you go ahead with your comments now? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, a lot of what I may have said has been said, but let me uh, give a little bit of background why context matters. And several of you have mentioned the context. Canada is different from the US and Rotterdam is different from Cape Town. And India is very different. And I've wandered around the world a lot. Uh, my academic career started in Austin, Texas. I went to Atlanta to Emory University. Then I was provost at Singapore Management University. I was there for eight years. And then I came back to India after 43 years and people thought I'm totally crazy to do that. But uh, the context in India is very different. And one of the things that people have noted to me as I've traveled around the world, whether it's Helsinki or, or you know, London or whatever, is, you know, how come Indians turn out to be such good managers? So if you look at, uh, you know, whether we're talking about Google or Microsoft or even Nokia or, <clears throat> or MasterCard and now IBM, we see Indian CEOs. So I kind of joke back at them, look, things are so complex in India that once you get out of India, life is so simple. You know, life is orderly. It's easy to do well outside of India. And uh, all joking aside, you know, what we have to do in India, you cannot ignore the environment we live in. You cannot ignore the role of government. It is not, uh, you know, it's not capitalism. You know, you have a country which has huge, immense problems, whether they're related to 
health or education. Um, people talk about the economic dividend in India because we've got so much, so many young people, but that economic dividend is a big problem if we fail to educate them. So one thing that I talked about to the board at ISB even before I joined is that unlike the Germanic model of research education and education, ISB needed to focus on impact, you know, which is you know, we had to work with industry and we had to work with government because without that, you know, what we were doing is we were into our own silos and all, most of the business schools, we are, we are deans out here, so we're talking very globally. But when you get into a school, it is highly departmentalized. The finance people don't talk to strategy, strategy people don't talk to accounting, Accounting people don't talk to marketing, but all the problems that we face are rather wicked problems, they're multidisciplinary. The one thing that we did at uh, ISB is that all the research centers are multidisciplinary. Um, the marketing group that I belong to said, look, you know, we have, how come we can't have a marketing center? I said, we already have a marketing department. Why do we need a marketing research center? You know, you are the marketing research center. So what we do is we support, uh, for example, uh, an institute that looks at healthcare, an institute that looks at infrastructure, uh, an institute that looks at analytics. Uh, analytics is also multidisciplinary. So one, the key thing to me is that we need to focus on problems that are worth solving. Now, what that means is uh, we have to look at uh, uh, you know, what uh, the government and industry needs, and frankly, what is needed in the context of the pandemic. Um, efficiency, focusing on quarterly return on investment, I mean, it's, it doesn't work. What we have to do and what we are not doing is really focusing on how do we recover post-pandemic, how do we build resilience into organizations, and how do we come up with mechanisms that allow us to succeed in the future. So that's the other thing. You know, All our thinking is based on causal inference and this and that. But we have to reimagine the future, and that includes the business school and the, the role of the government, how the government you know, works uh, you know, with the business school. So one thing that we're doing at ISP is kind of looking at how do we contribute to, to education, not just business education, but how can businesses contribute to education? A big problem in India is employability. People get degrees that are so irrelevant that industry has to retrain these people and I think a closer collaboration is needed between industry and academia. And you know, to a very small extent, we are trying to do that. We started a program for senior managers on artificial intelligence and machine learning, and we co-taught it with Microsoft. So not only do we need collaboration, let's say between Victoria and ISP, but we also need collaboration with the business community and with, with the government. So we have started a program called Jumpstart India at ISP. And this came out because of the pandemic. And the reason it came out is that we were having to delay the start of the program. So the capstone course, the experiential learning course that used to be at the end of the program, we decided to put it at the front end of the program. And now we are working with several states in India, looking at the issues that they're facing and trying to figure out uh, what are some ways in which the school can contribute. And we've looked at ways, uh, including the program with Arvinita is in, it's called the Executive Fellows Program. Uh, this morning, I got an email from the batch previous to yours, Vinita, but the batch we admitted to 2019. There's uh, 17 senior executives there, average of 22 years of experience. Six of them have gotten together and they have now started a company. They came in for education, but they said, look, we need to focus on what we can do to help the gig economy. So what we really need, I mean, the India has been a gig economy all the time. You know, we've had all these right. small little shops that survive. And so now, now they're kind of setting up a platform to help the gig economy. And this is the kind of thing that we need. We need senior managers to turn into, to look at education and see how they can help the country. I've got a lot of notes that I've made, but I'm not going to go into them because I'll no, we'll all the time. Yeah. We'll, we'll carry on with this discussion. And your words, Raj, have really reminded me is I lived in New York after 9-11. Uh, and then a few years later came Hurricane Katrina, which was a big storm. And the words have stuck with me since then. It was the um, 
the then CEO of Walmart, Lee Scott, and he sent a memo to everybody, every store manager in the imperiled area, er, to everyone. He said, a lot of you are going to have to make decisions above your level. Make the best decision that you can with the information that's available to you at the time and above all, do the right thing. So it touches on a lot of these issues, which is trust. What are we training people for? So I'm going to go back uh, before we kind of open up our conversation to Andy and say, uh, what have you learned <laughs> in the last little while? What stands out for you? How many hours do we have for me to cover this? <laughs> uh, let me try and do something really quickly and try and give some structure to what I just heard. Um, and I'm going to touch on something everybody said, but, um, but I'm not going to use names. Um, at the beginning, I want to say that we hear a lot of talk of systems change, but a lot of hand waving goes with it. No one was that knows what that is, and it requires changing different pieces and different inter interconnections. And that's what I heard in all the remarks. We're in a period of transformation, and people are experimenting with different ideas to reimagine uh, business education and business. Uh, to begin, I heard uh, the the argument, the observation that we're blending opinion and fact. And I think that's true, and I think that's critically dangerous for our society. And that challenge places the gauntlet at the door of academia. Uh, if you want to read a really interesting report on this, the Rand Corporation produced a report called Truth Decay, pointing out this very, fa this very observation that we're blending opinion and fact. And to my mind, who can step in to address that problem if not academia? Uh, facts and information are stock and trade. If we're not going to provide our knowledge to society, who will? Um, we heard about passionate confrontation and not rational behavior. So we need to step into society, I think is the first point. Going from there, what are the different ways we can start to rethink education? And I heard a lot of things, multidisciplinarity, bringing in the ethical dimensions, recognizing that business people have great power. With that power comes responsibility. I think of um, uh, uh, Rakesh Karana's book, From Higher Aims to Hired Hands, or From Hired Hands to Hired Hands, From Higher Aims to Hired Hands. And he points out that we used to think of teaching business in the, in the spirit of the way we treat doctors and lawyers to serve society. And we've lost that mandate. We need to get it back. We heard about developing trust and about attending to people's mental health, focusing more on collaboration and multi stakeholder engagement. Um, we heard about people thinking about pay scales and how that contributes to income inequality. CEO scale uh, pay is going through the roof. I mean, Jeff Bezos is about to become the world's first trillionaire in a moment where we have uh, unemployment at staggering levels. Uh, we heard about the, the dangers of short-termism. So all that leads to my reaction to some things that were said that we are in the period of transformation right now. COVID is a catalyst. That's what Pear said. It's an opportunity right now. If you want to talk about Thomas Kuhn's idea, we're in a period of revolutionary science. And so that comes down to the question, what is going to stick from this period of, of confusion, of, of chaos? What will be the new normal? And we have to have a role in both trying to predict that, but also ushering it in. A lot of people talked about the idea that we have to manage the present, but we have to invent the future. And that's our role in academia. That's our role in business. One thing we can do right off the bat, look at this panel. It's got a mix of business people, government people, and business educators. And we need to start to foster those linkages again. Business schools, you, academia in general has become too, too siloed, too focusing on our theoretical journals for our theoretical colleagues, disconnected from the world around us. You know, Nicola, Nicola talked about the idea of connecting more to impact impact beyond our academic communities. How can we do that? Um, I do want to point out, I do think it's the market that needs to solve these problems. And when I think of market, I think of the market, including business, nonprofits, civil society, and importantly, government. Government is missing, radically missing from our business education. We need to bring government back into this. At the end of the day, I like to think of this that what, we, what our challenge right now is to, to elevate business and business education to a, a vocation or a calling uh, in the same spirit as doctors and lawyers. And right now, we're not equipped to do that. Our research, if, you, if you've seen the information, data, knowledge, wisdom pyramid, um, we, we take information, we look at relations and create data. 
We take that data, look at patterns and create knowledge. And we stop there in education and business education. We have one more step we need to fill in. And that's taking that knowledge, turning it into wisdom. And to do that, we need to apply principles. We need to apply aspirational principles. And that is sorely missing from business education. So, you know, someone said we need to create citizens, global citizens. We need to teach people how to learn how to learn. That is consistent with a vocational calling in management. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Andy. That's an excellent summary of really some of the highlights that we that we hit upon. And there are a couple of things. It's uh, about this multidisciplinary approach. And and again, in my own experience with um, people who are interested in the media, you know, they they shouldn't be taking just media classes. Uh, that that's kind of the technical aspect of it. You've got to have ethical instruction. You've got to understand political science and sociology. You have to know history. Um, if you're going to be, be in, in the world of media, at least the old world that I was part of, I think we're in some different world now where uh, fact and opinion uh, uh, have, the, the wall is very high between the two. Uh, so I want to talk about that and whether that's a realistic approach. And I'm, I'm going to go to, to pair on that and just say and remind everybody that if you're going to speak, just unmute yourself. You you have that uh, you have that task. So, Pear Kramer, just are we are we getting even anywhere close to that? Where what we're producing in business schools, people have even thought about these ideas upon graduation. I think so. Uh, I think there has been quite a radical change. Uh, in business schools, in many business schools. I can also see that we have a changing demand, both in business and the public sector, when it comes to risk, to employ uh, competence that includes responsibility. Uh, for example, I mean, when we started to integrate sustainability perspectives in our programs in Gothenburg tw- 2012, uh, that was seen as a novelty. Now we have a pressure from a business that to do more. But I just wanted to shift the perspective a little bit. Sure. I think it's also very important that we can, there is always a little bit of paradise in a disaster area. And uh, I would say that the pandemic, the crisis of the pandemic as such, could also open the windows of opportunity. Uh, for change. And I think we can see that quite uh, evident right now. Uh, For example, a higher degree of sustainability in societies. We are today cooperating with the Swedish government, with the local government and Volvo Car Cooperation in uh, experimental research regarding a rapid uh, outsourcing of all combustion engines within the Volvo Car Corporation and the effects of that. They could do that. They could actually lay off all engineers working with the development of combustion engineer uh, combustion engines due to the pandemic and get them into re, re-education projects. And that is due to also the combination of a collaboration between business, academia, and the government that pays for this. And Mm -hmm. if we see also at the European Green Deal, the recovery and resilience facility decided upon by the European uh, Union, uh, exactly the same kind of conditionality we find there that investments at least 30% of the investments done, they have to be funneled towards furthering sustainability. So my point is really that as business schools, we should must cooperate, as many has pointed out, with surrounding society and turning this tragedy into an opportunity. Okay, thank you. I, I, if someone wants to comment on that, please jump in. But I'm going to go to uh, Vanita and just say, you know, from your perspective, from the business side, um, 
Are, are you seeing any of that? Um, Pear seems to think that this is already underway, but I'm wondering what you see in terms of those that come out of the, uh, the business school. Yeah, so I think uh, Pear is lucky to probably live in a progressive nation. And unfortunately in India, I don't think uh, our research is really incentivized either by the government or it is not seen as a lucrative uh, uh, initiative by a lot of the industry and um, uh, very, very few industries actually have their own R&D departments. In fact, my own company has an R&D department. We've been in this business uh, for the last 60 years now. And for the last uh, almost uh, 55 years, we've actually have a government certified research uh, program happening in the analytical instrumentation phase. Sadly, uh, the support that we do find from government is very, very minimal. And uh, while we do look at creating better products that are sustainable, that are actually helping uh, companies and uh, regulatory bodies in their quality aspects, very, very few companies do think in these terms. So unless government, as uh, Per did uh, mention uh, in, in Sweden, as if governments actually do support, I'm sure a lot more industries would actually take the bait and get into uh, investments. Uh, they would pool in their investments in the R&D uh, capabilities. All right, I've just got a problem here. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Can anyone? Yes. Okay, great. I've, I've lost yeah. my visual here. But I, I want to go to Merrick at this point because you were raising this issue that, you know, when you're dealing with a, uh, a country that is not as wealthy as others, these, these notions of government funding new and progressive ideas um, are even more difficult to attain in the midst of a crisis. So, so, I, <clears throat> so I'd like to address what I consider to be two really pressing issues. One, as the recipient of graduates coming out of business schools uh, within our organization, what we see sorely lacking, both in South Africa and across the African continent, are graduates who have a sense of conscious awareness of, of society and the environment. So responsible leadership seems to be lacking in the teaching process. So short-term, profit-driven, motivated thinking, core business school management thinking, seems to be at the forefront of their particular learning. And the the, the responsible and ethical outcomes that, that are core to the sustainable long-term uh, survival and success of organizations seems uh, severely uh, lacking at every level. And then when we look at the workforce and, and the labor force that, that we engage with and that, and that the, the continent engages with, there is a, a real need right now to, to address the issue of reskilling a labor force for, the, for what we call the future world of work. So across the African continent, and particularly in South Africa, we see uh, what we call traditional teaching coming out of either technicons or business schools. And there is really no real sense of understanding that be it autonomy, be it AI, be it mechanization, is really changing the way that labor forces engage with their, the outcomes of the business that they do. And so the product that they produce will ultimately make them redundant by virtue of the, the means to production. So reskilling, reteaching, retraining needs to be at the very forefront, again, of some of the teaching uh, within the business school environment. And as the recipient of this labor force, as the, as the engager of this workforce, we think that uh, we need to see responsible, ethical, and retraining of workforces and, and really just the teaching of those particular elements as critical to future sustainability. That just leads me to want to go to Wendy uh, Hansen and say, there you are on the front lines. Uh, you know, if there's one thing you could say to the business school deans, please give me this quality in a person when you send them out to either work uh, in the private sector or for government or in the policy side? What are you looking for? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. I've been reflecting on it as I'm hearing everyone's insights here today. 
you know, I think in speaking only for Canada, you know, healthcare is quite insular in the way we grow our leadership. And we really don't leverage or take opportunity to, to broaden our, our, our way that we approach leadership style. And, you know, the new world order around the sense of social responsibility and the concept of sustainability, these are still very new um, uh, uh, strategies that organizations broadly are starting to adapt. So I think the concept of being able to lead in complex systems and be able to um, Im embed that sort of uh, leadership qualities into our leaders and take that sense of uh, social responsibility is critical. And I think on the, as well, it's been touched on, but the relationship to government, our, our systems have to catch up as well as a publicly funded mm -hmm. system. We, we don't make it easy to be very nimble or agile in terms of adopting innovations or even if you look at the way we, our procurement policies, things of that nature, it makes it very difficult for to, us to collaborate with private sector. And I experienced this with a lot of the work that I've done in digital health. It, it, it's, a, it's a very new for uh, healthcare organizations to be able to co-create with um, in, in organizations like the digital health supercluster to be able to accelerate innovation in ways that we really need to catch up and, and innovate. I've often heard the con conversation that folks often have more uh, progressive technology in their home dealing with their <laughs> high school students and, and kids than we often do in our healthcare organization. So we are in that catch up role. But again, the one thing for me would be the ability for um, leaders coming into our system that can really deal in complexity um, really know how to drive collaborative partnerships and uh, to be able to um, work across sec all sectors um, in, a in a collaborative and productive way. Thank you for that. And, and I want to go to uh, Maury for his comments because including or building on what Wendy just said, I mean, obviously people have to be schooled in risk assessment. Every single decision that people are making on the spur of the moment without all the facts in hand, you have to have that in the back of your mind uh, at every moment. Yeah, thanks for that, Pamela. I was just going to ask to come in at this point anyway. Um, <laughs> there is some good news, right? And, and there's good news both on the, the business side and on the education side, which is that the, the dialogue, the global dialogue about the future of business and the future of business education having to be more, as we were saying earlier, uh, long-term, uh, inclusive, um, and really you know, oriented toward a sustainable global future. This has been happening now at least the last two, three years, a, a group of um, business deans uh, convened, actually it was Julia Christensen from Guelph who, who invited us the last two years at Davos uh, for the conversations around, um, you know, what's the future of education and what do we want, what does business want from us? And, and this year, Paul Pullman and a number of other business leaders were there facing off against a bunch of us business deans saying, guys, you need to do, you know, X, Y, Z, which is a wonderful uh, conversation. And I must say they didn't hold back. Uh, but but there is also demand from the students in many cases. And so, you know, if you get it from the recruiters, you get it from the students, and it's starting to, to feel uh, more real. And you've got your business roundtable uh, in the U.S., your U.N. Global Compact with now the SDG um, Ambition Program, which is all about specifying a few of the global goals that are central to the future of your business. Well, we're mirroring that in business education, a number of, of the tools here. And then the last thing I'll say is just that on the government side, some of them are looking to figure out how to be uh, faster and more flexible. We've got a client, I was just working with this morning on our executive ed education side, federal government client, that wants to do exactly that. So I think it's bits and pieces like any, like any evolution, right? But it, I think, is at critical mass. And before the pandemic hit, I was saying after Davos in January, I think this is a critical mass year for business focusing on the responsible future. So let's see if I'm, I turn out to be right. Thanks very much, Maury, for that. I'm going to go to Raj now at this point because you also uh, uh, cross uh, worlds, working in in the U.S. and working in India, and seeing it from two very different perspectives. Can business schools actually be the ones that create the next generation of leaders, or do people have to get into the real world to get real world experience? Can you bring that into the school? Well, uh, there's one thing unique about ISB is that we are only a post-experience school. We're not undergraduate. We're only a postgraduate program. And we don't admit people until they have some experience under the belt. So we really do believe that uh, you need to bring theory and practice together. And that's reflected in our programs. I think as we move forward, this notion 
that academia must work with industry and with government really needs to be implemented. I'll come back to my comment about uh, the need for education as a problem that needs to be solved in India. Uh, we've got, uh, for example, Deloitte in Hyderabad. And Deloitte is expanding the offices in Hyderabad to employ 52,000 people in Hyderabad alone. Okay, so, I mean, so what we have in India is a lot of potential talent that needs to be converted into real talent. And we need to think of the future. So one of my good friends, Liam Fahey, has written a book titled Learning from the Future. Uh, every great leader has a North Star. You know, it's a belief system. We may call it ideology, but sometimes we need to have aspirations that we need to march towards. And let's say if I look at healthcare, education in healthcare, any part of the world you go, I don't care if you go to the southern tip of Argentina to Terra del Fuego, you'll find an Indian doctor. Then when you start looking around hospitals, you'll find, and you ask where the nurses are coming from, the number one response is usually Philippines. The number two response is Kerala. It's not even India. They say Kerala. They're so particular about that. Now, why can't India look at healthcare as an opportunity and say, in addition to doctors and nurses, why can't we look at medical technology? Why can't we be you know, training people in pathology and running labs, et cetera, et cetera? And we need to start looking at ecosystems. So I've been involved in a panel you know, that has been put together by the prime minister's office called WebHub. And we're looking at how industry, academia, and government can work together to create clusters. These are knowledge clusters, these are research clusters, but the idea is that, let's say if we look at health, just in Hyderabad, we have uh, Apollo hospitals, or we have Dr. Reddy's lab, and you know, we have uh, people in uh, Indian Institute of Technology that work on medtech, it's not just only tech tech. And then we have places like ISP. Why can't we get together and look at how do we integrate healthcare and pharma and come up with Think of it as a you know, free trade zone where research and education and employment are all integrated. So I think well, you we have to look at problems worth solving. And I think uh, we have to look at, let me just go one step further. Um, one problem that we have in India is that we have uh, public administrators and we have the corporate sector, and rarely the two talk. Uh, places like ISB have a role in ensuring that we become not a round table, I've started using the word, uh, the phrase learning table. Can mm -hmm. government, industry, and academia get together on a learning table to discuss things, to see how change needs to be, you know, to be developed for the future? We can't just look at the past. We have to say what needs to happen for the future. So no, that's a, a really good point. Yeah. And, and the whole notion of kind of specializing, I've got to tell you, here in my hometown, Wadena, Saskatchewan, 1,300 people, 1,400 people. We have Indian doctors and Filipino nurses. And you're, you're absolutely right. You're talking about some global trends. So, uh, so people, maybe the business schools have to learn to, to specialize in that sense and, and meet the market demand that's there and say, we're the ones that are going to do this. Uh, let me uh, go I'm to... If I may take one yeah. more moment. One of the things we're doing is we put together a program uh, in, in public policy, but we should yeah. really rename it public management. We need government servants, we need uh, you know, public administrators and public policy people to become managers. Absolutely. It's one thing to administer, which is to give orders. It's another thing to find out a solution. And so that is one of the programs that ISP delivers, trying to give, bring government and industry together into public management. No, that's uh, absolutely that's uh, and and the the level of expertise is is not there on um, sometimes in the uh, in the levels of bureaucracy and people move around and they need the same kind of uh, skill set. Let me go to uh, Percy uh, for some comments uh, on this because you've talked about 
this this culture of trust and and we still need the rules to operate by but we have to be on two parallel paths um it's it's a good point do you think there's going to be a fast enough response from the business schools bureaucracies and universities have them too move slowly can can we do those two things in parallel well it uh, really depends on the governance of each business schools uh, as more traditional uh, governance more difficult to go faster uh, in our business school we have a special model where in some sense uh, the business school works like a company so what is decided in the board of the business school it's going to be implemented uh, but the real problem is not the definitions and the structure or strategic decisions the key challenge is that we have to convince each faculty member to follow the strategic goals because finally all what we define is the the trust moment is in the classroom and if we don't convince the hearts and the minds of the faculty we are not going to do nothing that's our that let's the bigger challenge uh, how can we convince the, shall, uh, the faculty to try to work together, not to, to help us to make the strategic goals affordable? And uh, an additional suggestion that I would like to make is that uh, we have realized in our business school, we have been one of the first signatories of Primey. We are part of many CSR initiatives, but uh, we have realized recently that we it speaks more than we do because we have not been measuring the impact of what we have been doing before. Now we have decided to speak less, to talk the walk, and to try to define very concrete key PI who can help us to measure the really impact. I, I'm gonna give you an example. We have decided that all our thesis, uh, we don't accept any more academic thesis for the MBA program. All the, all the students have to make a project of a social entrepreneurship project. Okay, uh, okay, we have decided and we suppose that is going to work, but I decided to attend the um, the defense of the thesis and what do I realize is that they speak that they are developing shared value projects, but in the really analyze of the program, they are profitable projects like, uh, like always. And just the, the wording is referred to the ODS, uh, to the sustainable goals. But, but when we ask just a simple question, how much do you impact in that, uh, Sustainable goal, nothing, no answer, because they have not uh, tried to relate it. So what we have to define business uh, schools together and in coordination with the accreditation bodies is try to be evaluated more in impact, not in the process, in the results and in the impact that we should create together with the faculty. Thank you very much, Percy. Now we're quickly uh, uh, coming to the end of our session. So I wanna get some final comments from Nicola and from Christian, and then we'll uh, wrap up with uh, Andy and myself before we, we hand back. So uh, Nicola, go ahead with your thoughts on what next. I think one of the things to celebrate um, is <laughs> the way that business schools have been forced to respond quickly because we have seen business schools and, and universities more than business schools. I agree with Percy's point. It's not always business schools, but move at, at a glacial pace. And that's not as fast as our glaciers are melting either. Um, and I think what the pandemic did was absolutely jolt systems. And I hope create a sense of energy that says we can actually move fast. And sometimes it might be seen as suboptimal and I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be consultative in it, but um, I hope that that's unlocked a pace of change because I think universities have lagged behind where business has to change. So I'm, I'm also optimistic about the fact that sometimes you really need that slap of cold water on the face to, um, to expedite what needs to be done. 
Well, it, we certainly it was certainly was that uh, where I think we're still in the midst of the, uh, the these very powerful shock waves. So, Christian, let me uh, turn to you. You've heard a lot of things here today. What have you concluded? Um, well, a couple of things. I'll, I'll, I'll say one on the short term and then I suppose one on the long term. So um, practically speaking, I think we need to remember that we're uh, dealing with immediate challenges from a business perspective right now. So many of my clients uh, have gone from great uh, economic times to zero revenue and are on the verge of bankruptcy. So let's not forget that there's practical tools that, that need to be taught and need to be put in place to deal with these short-term uh, challenges. I'm a former CFO and spent a lot of time doing cash flow forecasts, but do, does anybody understand why we need to be doing 13 week cash flow uh, right now? Why, do, why do, are we looking at the sensitivity analysis associated with different kinds of scenario planning? Uh, good, bad, medium. Uh, why are we looking at the sensitivity to your supply chain that may be impacted by the pandemic? I mean, these are real practical things that need to be dealt with right now before this economy goes further down the drain. Um, on the long term, I'd like to pick up on, on what Wendy talked about and, and others. I'm a former assistant deputy minister as well, and, and the collaboration between government and industry is not good. Um, and uh, when you think about innovation, um, innovation sometimes equates to risk. And the public service is not terribly uh, excited about getting into risk that, uh, because there's, not quite a, there's no incentive to do so. So I think that there is uh, an important factor that the schools can play in order to convene to use the power of convening. It's not unlike what the power of convening that a, that a firm like Deloitte has. And, and universities are an independent convener and, and can sit in the middle of, of industry and government and find ways to, to address these significant uh, challenges in the future. So. Yeah, uh, very well put. Excellent. Um, and it's, it's, it reminds me of uh, a, a quote that I just love, that managers do the thing right and leaders do the right thing. And we need to merge those two, right? They, th those individuals that schools are producing need to, uh, per, you know, create people who are not, and to your point, Christian, that aren't so risk averse, whether it's on the government side or, or the business side. So uh, take a couple of minutes, if you will, Andy, and tell us your thoughts at the end of this. Okay. When I hear this conversation, what I'm reminded of is a Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. <laughs> you live in interesting times. Um, COVID, you know, it's a catalyst, but a catalyst causes a reaction to happen that would have happened otherwise. It speeds it up. We're in the bit of a, a jolt, as Nicholas said. We're in a bit of a disruption. And that's very different. Change had begun before COVID. Um, uh, before COVID, 40% of Americans could not pull together $400 in emergency. They're in that emergency now. And whenever I shoot, use that quote with people, I ask them, what would you do if you were in dire straits and had to put on food on the table? And their answer is, I'd do whatever I have to do. If you have 50% of Americans, half of Americans in that situation, you've got a very unstable society. And that's the reality we're in right now. The future is extremely uncertain. But as, as Maury pointed out, the conversation was engaged before COVID. You had the World Economic Forum, the Business Roundtable, even BlackRock saying shareholder primacy, that's really not gonna work going forward. We need to rethink the purpose of the corporation. And yet as I walk around my own business school and I suspect if I walked around yours or walked around your companies or walked on the streets of your city, and put a mic in front of the people I ran into and said, finish this sentence. The purpose of the corporation is to, they will pair it back to me, make money for the shareholder. We have, to, we have to put an end to that idea and broaden the idea of the purpose of a corporation. I'm always reminded of Peter Drucker's idea. Purpose of the corporation is to identify and serve a market, serve a customer. Whether you make money is a measure of how well you do that. And we've lost sight of that. We need to bring it back. Now, in any great disruption, there are two challenges, and this is the same. First, you need social entrepreneurs. You need champions who are going to actually identify the problem, call it what it is, and the problem identified is a problem half solved. 
And so we need to have people coming out and saying, folks, this is what we're looking at and this is what we need to do. This is how we need to change. And then the challenge for academia is that it has to be institutional change. One school can do it all by themselves. They do run a risk. Will the rankings hammer them? Will people not wanna work there? Will students not wanna go there? We need to change everything, but there is hope there. As has been pointed out, students are clamoring for this. Business is starting to ask for it. Society is starting to ask for it. Um, we are in the midst of institutional change. That should give us hope, but we need to roll our sleeves up. You know, someone remarked about what is hope. Uh, yeah, uh, like, um, David Orr's quote that uh, hope is a, is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. <laughs> we need to have hope, we need to have passion, we need to have people who are going to drive change. And I look around at this panel and I, I, I see those people that are going to do it. Absolutely. It, it, make, it does make you a little bit more optimistic because we can't fix it and if we don't name it and we have named it today. Just a couple of uh, parting thoughts before I hand things over to Sadir again. Um, I think we should all, and this has been um, a huge opportunity to do that, which is take note of what this moment has revealed to us about our leaders, about our institutions, about how we function and cooperate together. This is really important, regardless of what perspective you come from. We have learned that we need to play both offense and defense if we're going to manage this situation. And back to my earlier comments about what we saw happen in the wake of crisis, provide rising leaders with the latitude to lead. Give them the ethical and the moral skills, not only just the educational skills, so that we can trust them to lead us through uh, crisis and very, very difficult situations. So I just cannot thank you um, uh, enough for your perspectives on this today. It's been a very, very valuable session. I know for some of you, it's in the middle of the uh, getting the, the, the late hours or the early hours of the morning. So thanks again for all your participation. And Sadir, I'll uh, turn back to you. Thank, thank you, uh, Pamela. Uh, let me first start by thanking uh, Pamela Wallen for doing an amazing job uh, keeping this discussion going. It was <laughs> a genuine pleasure for me to listen to all of you. Um, thank you all for taking the time. Uh, I know, and again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, <laughs> my, my apologies that we could not get to some, some of the questions, but I think the questions raised uh, have been answered to, to some extent by the discussions. Um, I, for one, uh, will, will adopt Andy's words of uh, rolling up my sleeves and being hopeful this has been a confirmation of that. I am excited and, and thank you all for being part of the Victoria Forum and this session. Thank you, bye. This ends today's webinar. Thank you for attending.